Hi, I'm Eric Hoyt, a uh, research fellow with Whale and Dolphin Conservation and co-chair of the IUCN Marine Mammal Protected Areas Task Force. And I'm happy to present uh, uh, to you today a uh, um, PowerPoint that um, uh, we've prepared for the task force. I will share my screen now. Okay, so uh, I'd like to introduce you to uh, a hands-on tool that can be used for the spatial habitat protection of the 130 species of marine mammal, uh, marine mammals, as well as the associated biodiversity. And as you know, the 130 species um, include 90 uh, whales, dolphins, and porpoises, 33 seals, sea lions, and the walrus, uh, as well as sea otters, um, a species of river otter, river otter uh, dugong, um, manatees, and polar bear. And uh, the interesting and valuable thing about them is that they are tethered to the surface by their need to breathe air. And this makes them really valuable in terms of being indicators of biodiversity as well as of the health of the sea and what's below. Uh, so this project started <clears throat> with uh, thinking about marine protected areas for whales, dolphins, and porpoises as part of a book that I wrote in two editions in uh, 2005 and 2011 and uh, to try to look at all the areas around the world where um, uh, whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and to some extent other marine mammals were being uh, included in marine protected areas. And this had um, uh, grown out of an interest over a couple of decades. And, and really initially, uh, I mean, the first protected area that included marine mammals what really only dates from the 1970s. So it, all this work was really fairly recent. Uh, and, uh, you know, we just wanted to get a handle on whether um, marine mammals were actually being included in protection efforts. And so came up with this map. The red areas are existing marine protected areas. The blue areas are proposed. The tan areas are ecologically or biologically significant areas as part of the um, Convention on Biological Diversity. And, uh, you know, what we saw was that um, putting all these together, this is a sort of output from my book, um, you know, more than 600 areas, but most of them were um, politically or socioeconomically shaped in the sense that they may have started out with habitat for a particular species or population uh, of marine mammals, but they, uh, once they went through the process of becoming a marine protected area, uh, they were um, uh, shaved down, you know, into much smaller size and, and given really a political uh, shaped to the uh, eventual boundaries. And if you look at these areas, I mean, a lot of them you can't see because they're really dots along the coastlines, but even the larger areas are in um, uh, around islands or very close to the coastline. So you're getting this sort of ribbon, narrow ribbon of protection uh, in those areas, but not in the much larger part of the ocean. And so we were seeing that partly through starting to attend um, Convention on Biological Diversity meetings, the EBSA meetings, that uh, marine mammals were not really being considered very much in these international fora. And the uh, data to support making proposals for them was all over the place. And 
a lot of it unpublished. And really we needed some kind of handy tool um, that we could use to bring to these meetings and also to give to uh, national governments who are doing marine spatial planning and, and marine protected areas. So in, um, in about 2009, 2008, we formed a group called the International Committee on Marine Mammal Protected Areas. And uh, the main goal of that group was to have conferences. And of course we had one in uh, 2011 in Martinique um, and uh, uh, sponsored by the French um, government. And we, uh, and NOAA, and, and we really um, uh, learned a lot through that process and started building exchanges between people and uh, uh, working on networks uh, as a big theme of that group. Uh, but we wanted more traction in the international committee, uh, international scene. And really, um, we figured we needed a task force through IUCN um, you know, that that would be one way to possibly achieve this. So we set this up in 2013 after the, um, well, during the Marine Protected Area meetings uh, in uh, Marseille. And really we focused mainly on this uh, last objective um, to date, uh, the uh, enhancing the capacity with new conservation tools. Um, and we've, we've, we've built up uh, you know, this it was much smaller, of course, when we started, but it's it's been building up over uh, the previous um, six, seven years now. So the the main tool that we've developed that we've really worked on has been this important marine mammal areas, IMAs, and they are a place-based conservation tool. That uh, the definition is that IMAs are discrete portions of habitat important for one or more marine mammal species that have the potential to be delineated and managed for conservation. They're not protected areas and they're not identified on the basis of management considerations. So the identification of IMAs uh, is an evidence-driven, purely biocentric process, you know, not political, not uh, socioeconomic, based on the application of scientific criteria and on the best available science. And I'll, I'll come back to that definition a few times. So this is our uh, program through um, GOBI, um, the Global Ocean Biodiversity Initiative that was approved in um, 2016. Um, and uh, when that was approved, which was largely to do these areas in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, you know, to identify IMAs uh, in all these areas, we um, also obtained um, funds to uh, do a pilot project in the Mediterranean. So that was our first effort in late 2016. And then we moved into the Gobi work in the Pacific Islands, and then across the Pacific Ocean. And then last February, we were in Perth um, with um, Australian and New Zealand biologists uh, doing uh, the work there. Um, the one, the one um, different area was the extended Southern Ocean around Antarctica, which was sponsored by the French Biodiversity Agency, largely. We have one more workshop to go in the Gobi uh, work which is off the west coast of Latin America from Mexico to Chile, which was scheduled actually for last September, but because of COVID um, has been postponed and will probably be now an online workshop. So each um, workshop uh, follows this uh, predefined process um, where we identify candidate IMAs CMs in the workshop on the basis of received proposals from areas for areas of interest. Uh, and after the workshop, the candidate IMAs would then go to a review panel, independent review panel, to verify that the criteria were applied correctly and that these are all done 
on the basis of robust scientific information. And then the candidate IMAs become IMAs and are made publicly available on our website, uh, which you can see below. So the three stages, as I outlined, uh, areas of interest. This happens before the workshop. Um, anybody could nominate an area of interest. Uh, and then stage two is in the workshop when the, um, 30 to 50 scientists work on making these uh, into candidate IMAs and agree upon them uh, based on applying criteria, which I'll go through in a while. And then uh, the stage three, when they become IMAs. And here are some visualizations of several regions of the world. Uh, so you can see what it looks like at the start of the workshop. Um, this is the Mediterranean, and then this is workshop results with the candidate IMAs and uh, areas for which there was not enough evidence. So it becomes a um, an area of interest. And then lastly, with the re review results, this is what it looks like. And some areas simply stay as candidate M as if, if all the evidence is not there or all the uh, reviewer suggestions are not addressed. Um, but they, they can become M as quite easily. The areas of interest um, will require substantial more research and can't become an IMA until, or even a candidate IMA until uh, a future workshop. Uh, but we felt they're useful to be kept on the map uh, as areas to highlight that may become IMAs in the future and may be worth monitoring, doing research, all of that. These are the Pacific Islands, the three um, snapshots give you an idea. And this is the Northeast Indian Ocean and Southeast Asian seas. You can see an idea, get an idea there. So you can see not all these areas that are proposed to the reviewers. I think about one third, one fifth to one third are turned down and either revert to uh, areas of interest or candidate IMAs after the review. And so we spent a lot of time working on the website and trying to get this e-atlas in place, um, which you can take a look at here. And we now have 159 IMAs identified uh, through the uh, regions where we've worked. You can actually see two different projections on the e-atlas. So you can see the Antarctic without the, the bias of, um, or without the great um, distortion that you get with a flat map. And when you click on any area, you'll get a summary uh, at the name of that area and, and a summary of it. And uh, then you can go in further and get maps of the individual IMA and the size of it and qualifying species and something about the uh, criteria that were used to create it. So these are just some scenes from the various workshops. Um, it's been an extraordinary experience to um, go into these different areas. And, you know, in some cases, we'll know some of the researchers, but many of them we won't know. And uh, to, uh, you know, make friendships and really long lasting uh, associations with all of them has been a really rewarding part of this whole process. So the total area of the 159 IMAs is uh, 15.6 million square kilometers. The largest 2.8 million um, square kilometers is uh, the Prince Edward Islands and Western Oceanic Waters IMA in the extended Southern Ocean, uh, which has um, uh, habitat for two species of fur seals, Southern elephant seals and killer whales. The smallest IMA we have is the 45 square kilometer Akrotiri IMA, uh, which has these breeding caves for the Mediterranean monk seal. And just uh, about half of the IMAs are less than 10,000 kilometers in size, 
and only 13% of them are larger than 100,000 kilometers. Now the number of IMAs, candidate IMAs, and areas of interest by region, you can see here um, Australia, New Zealand, uh, you know, 31, this is the most re recent region where we were working. Uh, I might point out the African Atlantic and the European Atlantic are simply um, monk seal areas that were considered as part of other workshops. We haven't really worked in these areas yet. Now I'll talk a bit about the eight selection criteria and the identification process. Again, here's the definition on the right hand side for reference, but um, you can start to see these uh, different um, criteria, criteria coming up on the left hand side with various sub criteria. <clears throat> so we're looking essentially at eight um, different criteria if you um, uh, consider them separately from A to uh, D2. And we had a several year process, about two or three years, um, with more than a thousand experts going over and you know giving us feedback on the different criteria and um, you know trying to uh, make this as um, uh, appropriate and uh, useful for what we were trying to do in terms of identifying habitat. And a starting point for us, of course, was looking at what other uh, tools like the EBSA and the KBA and the biologically important area, the BIA, uh, cetacean or critical cetacean habitat through the CMS Treaty, ACABAMS, and um, the Ramsar uh, criteria. And look, and we tried to match up, you know, and really align ourselves because we were not trying to reinvent the wheel. We just wanted to capture um, the specifics of marine mammals. And most of them fit into these existing categories, you know, with a, with a couple of additional um, elements that we wanted to capture. <coughs> So looking at uh, the first one, species or population vulnerab vulnerability, um, I'm just, I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly right now. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, with, with brief examples. So uh, here with the, for the first one, we have um, qualifying species of dugong around the Southern shelf waters and reef edge of Palau where in fact we were able to visit in uh, 2018 uh, and see the dugong there. Um, but you can see that uh, it's, it's a case of having the data to support um, this criterion in order to fulfill it. So distribution and abundance. So these are areas supporting at least one resident population containing an important proportion of that species or population that are occupied consistently. And this uh, is the Maui dolphin off the uh, west coast of North Island of New Zealand. And uh, distribution and abundance, uh, areas with underlying qualities that support important concentrations of a species or population. And this is in the uh, Western Antarctic Peninsula uh, with blue fin humpback and killer whales and also the Antarctic fur seal. Key life cycle activities, uh, areas important for a species or population to mate, give birth or care for young. And here we have the sperm whale in the Mediterranean around the Balearics. Uh, key life cycle activities, feeding areas, of course, and there are many examples of these. And one would be the harbor porpoise in the uh, Northeast Mediterranean, northern coast actually of the Thracian Sea. Migration areas, um, migration movements, and here we're talking about the humpback whale along the Southeast African coast. Distinctiveness, and this brings in the culture 
and other uh, aspects of, uh, of, of uh, marine mammals that, that are important. And of course, also gen important genetic and uh, ecologically di distinctive characteristics. And a good example of this is the Irrawaddy dolphin uh, in the Northeast um, Indian Ocean, Southeast Asian seas, in the Balik Papan, uh, Adang and Apar Bays in uh, Indonesia. Uh, and then diversity, a very good example are the Maldives with 22 species of cetaceans. And uh, we have different uh, indices for, that we develop on, uh, for each workshop of each region to show, um, uh, to indicate uh, what would be considered diversity. It's, a, it's one of the, it's one criterion that changes um, by the region because diversity is a kind of a relative uh, matter. So this just shows you um, how many times um, criteria, specific criteria have been used to create IMAs. Um, <clears throat> and, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and I think it's important to say that um, many IMAs have been identified using several criteria, but you only need one criterion to uh, create an IMA. Uh, these are some of the species that have been used from humpback whales, uh, the most common, uh, dugong and uh, spinner dolphins, uh, obviously bottlenose dolphins and sperm whales right up there at the top. So this identification process, um, you know, is, uh, includes the first part, the pre-workshop part, um, collection of areas of interest, as I mentioned, as well as developing uh, an inventory of knowledge and uh, preparing data um, appraisal forms, knowledge assessments of the region. And of course, we draw on uh, uh, conventional biological diversity, EBSIS, uh, as well as uh, the Pr Protected Planet website has all the MPAs um, on, uh, you know, for di different species, bird life materials. So we'll, we'll use a lot of these as um, uh, areas of interest uh, if they, uh, if we think or we know they have uh, marine mammals. And then during the ep expert workshop, we review those submissions. We assign writing groups for all the people involved and uh, we make agreements on the um, final candidate IMA list. And we have templates that we draw up uh, during the workshop. And uh, after the workshop, those templates uh, filled out go, for, go to the uh, reviewers and uh, they may request uh, corrections or additional research. So IMA is a third part of my presentation. IMAs on their own mean very little unless there's implementation. So, you know, if you make a tool, you really want to show people um, how it's been used or how, how to use it. And, and fortunately, the need for marine mammal data in an accessible form is, is really appreciated. And we've seen um, huge uh, take up in uh, what we've been producing already. Uh, still there are gaps. So these are some of the um, conservation and management um, uh, agencies that may use products of the IMA process. Um, it would, and you can see them, you can read them down the, the list. And um, we've also, so we've approached all of these, uh, a lot of different agencies, including the IWC, the IMO, um, the uh, different branches of the IUCN, uh, national governments, Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, we also, um, uh, my co-chair Giuseppe Notabartolo de Sciara attends the Convention on Migratory Species as the Cetacean Counselor. And we, in 2017, we were able to get a resolution through CMS which acknowledged the IMA criteria and the value of it and requested all those national parties 
and range states to identify specific areas where the identification of MS could be beneficial. So this is this was a nice um, thing to be able to get uh, buy-in uh, for our process at an international level. So some of the follow-up um, things that have happened already, the EPSIS are um, including IMA layers in future revision of the, of the EPSA process are planning to do this. Uh, marine spatial planning, we can see examples where it's starting, where um, IMAs are starting to be, the IMA layer is starting to be used um, with proposed MPAs in Vietnam, Bangladesh, and other countries. They've been spurred on uh, using IMA, IMAs that were recently created, for example, at a regional workshop taking them back, scientists taking them back to their countries and, and putting them to use right away. Uh, also for MPA network planning, um, key biodiversity areas, that's a, a tool that's being used by the IUCN, KBAs, um, to identify all kinds of land-based and marine-based diversity. And in fact, through our workshop, we've been able to pull out th about 30 of these um, by having a, a, a KVA person uh, at all the workshops who um, is able to um, look at what thresholds might be available. The KVA process is a threshold-based process. And the US Navy has used IMAs to indicate where they will avoid testing low-frequency sonar um, which is quite interesting. And the IWC, we've had, had a workshop last year, or the year before, um, in which they adopted IMAs to identify ship strike ash issues and to work with IMO on uh, mitigation. <coughs> so we have on the eAtlas a searchable database. So this we've tried to make this information as accessible as possible and uh, you can filter the data and you can request um, spatial layer downloads. And I think we've had uh, uh, close to a hundred requests already from individuals as well as uh, governments and agencies um, for the spatial layer download. Uh, now rethinking uh, an, an MPA post IMA, uh, you can see the diamond-shaped area is the Pelago Sanctuary for Mediterranean Marine Mammals, uh, which was created in about uh, the year 2002 uh, as a very, I mean, it was a landmark area with uh, cooperation of Italy, France, and Monaco, uh, about 80, 87,000 square kilometers. But if we had had our IMA workshop before that declaration, it would have potentially been quite a different area. Uh, as you can see, the IMA extends further west um, of the, uh, the diamond-shaped area outside of the Pelago Sanctuary. And really the um, ship strike issues with fin whales and sperm whales are occurring outside of the Pelago Sanctuary in this western area. So really, uh, you know, that, that should have some level of protection. And in fact, ACABAMS and other agencies, uh, governments are now working on uh, creating something that uh, could extend the protection, maybe not extend the MPA, but with provisions to protect these um, endangered species, in fact, in the Mediterranean um, from uh, getting hit by ships. Uh, last November, uh, Giuseppe, my co-chair, and I um, visited Bazaruto Marine Park in um, uh, Mozambique and spent a couple weeks there uh, with local researchers and uh, Vic Cockcroft from South Africa, who's done a lot of work there for 20, at least 20 years, maybe 30 years, and local biologists who done amazing work um, and uh, we found that there uh, the IMA that had just been declared which you can see on the right hand side which is um, you know easily 
<clears throat> 10 or 20 times the size of the park. Uh, yeah, probably about, uh, yeah, 10 times, let's say, the size of the park. Um, the dugong habitat uh, for the last dugong population in East Africa, the last viable population, about 300 dugong, is located um, about 70% of them are outside the park. And there were various threats, you know, bycatch as well as um, Sasol, the um, uh, energy company from South Africa, um, had permits to, uh, to explore for gas and oil right in the heart of this habitat. And after, the, um, after our visit and after the IMA was created, we were very pleased to hear that um, uh, that you know the the IMA had in fact helped contribute to a situation where Sasol withdrew the permits and gave them back to the government. We don't know, you know, it's in the government's hands now whether this will become a protected area, but we can see the leverage that the IMA uh, helped to provide in this in this case. It's also a great area for. Um, endangered um, Indian Ocean humpback dolphins, I should mention as well, and, and humpback whales are all through this area. So this is just the template for the Bazarudo archipelago. So we'll see whether it becomes a, a full protected area or what will happen. <clears throat> so just looking at um, future directions and how this might um, fit into some of the plans in the uh, Caribbean. IMAs really give international scientific recognition to contribute to local or national pr uh, protection efforts. That's how we see this, the value of this. Um, you know, the, one of the main values. IMAs with baseline studies can then be used to monitor against threats to cetaceans, uh, ship strike noise, climate change, IMAs will play a role in the BBNJ process. Uh, we're hoping that they will help, that we can um, get a lot more uh, data on the high seas, uh, perhaps using satellite images to detect whales, eDNA, uh, acoustics, uh, wave gliders, all these kind of tools for getting information out on the high seas, which we really, uh, is, is one of the main problems that we have, that we do not have enough information outside of the national waters. Um, now, Northern Hemisphere IMA workshops, that's a um, big question. Uh, we're now uh, the last um, IMA workshop in the Gobi process will be the west coast of Latin America. And then we have no more funding, but we're, we've got several applications in. And we're really hoping to move to the North Atlantic next. And we'll um, uh, essentially have, have the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic to do. So that's five separate regions um, because it would be divided into the European side, the North American side, then uh, the Caribbean Gulf of Mexico separate, and finally the um, uh, the uh, Eastern, the African side of the um, South Atlantic and the South American side. And we see that monitoring and review of IMAs is needed regularly in regions at least every 10 years. Um, and we're, we're just think the big part of our job is going to be selling and implementing the IMA tool and integrating it uh, into uh, conservation. So I have I somehow have uh, a duplicate slide here, but I added a, I added the uh, element of the Caribbean Sea, as you can see in the fourth uh, element under discussion for 2022, 2025. So really, I think that's going to be the kind of window we're looking at for getting to the Caribbean. So I'm happy to answer any questions and uh, participate in the discussion uh, after. Thank you very much.